Thank you. Thank you. So today I'm talking about the Agorist archives of Samuel Edward Conk and the third. Now, as we know, uh, Sam was uh, the founding, one of the founding members of this organization along with Mike and Kent Hastings. And uh, his uh, publishing history extends all the way back to 1970. Um, he attended the uh, University of uh, Alberta and got a, his bachelor's degree there. He got his master's degree at the University of Wisconsin and he went to NYU to get his PhD in theoretical chemistry. He dropped out of his PhD program and in fact in the papers that I have I found the letter from the uh, university telling him that if he didn't turn something in he would be dropped out of the program. He decided he didn't want to get involved in uh, a science that basically built better bombs for the government. So he f forswore uh, a, a comfortable lifestyle, you know, working in the military industrial complex and decided to devote his time to libertarianism and uh, counter economics and agorism. So um, I met Sam uh, a few years ago, <laughs> like 40 nearly 50, 45 years ago. And he was uh, coming out from New York to LA. And I was living in Westwood in a reconverted women's restroom uh, in a former sorority house, which later got uh, bought by the sorority back again. So everyone had to leave. But that was after I left. Uh, in 1975, he came out. I met him for the first time. Uh, I, I had a different vision of him in my head than the, the uh, tall uh, but, but um, uh, slightly rounded, uh, you know, long haired but receding hairline, glasses, smoking a pipe, very laid back fellow that uh, I met. And uh, with him were uh, Neil Shulman and uh, Bob Cohen and Andy Thornton. And I think they actually stopped there on the same day that they arrived in LA and continued on to Long Beach where Dana Rohrabacher uh, drove them around looking for places to stay and uh, found the Anarcho Village that Chris Schaefer, also a libertarian, had uh, become manager of, or at least had a room there, eventually became manager. Um, and I moved in there about a year later and uh, hilarity ensued. And it became one of the most uh, prolific libertarian enclaves around. In fact, um, here are some of the publications that were started uh, at the Anarcho Village. New Libertarian Weekly, 101 issues. Uh, the Force, the first Star Wars fanzine. Uh, the Strategy of the Movement of the Libertarian Left, which was kind of like a newsletter. New Libertarian, the magazine. New Libertarian Strategy, which was another uh, uh, newsletter style format. The Orange County Supper Club newsletter. Tactics of the Movement of the Libertarian Left. The Smart Set, which was Sam's attempt to get a calendar of events for uh, libertarianism in the Southern California area. Strategy of the New Libertarian Alliance, which were two magazine, digest sized magazine uh, format uh, collections of st the first uh, the first uh, issue was a uh, critiques of New Libertarian Manifesto and Sam's responses to the critiques by Murray Rothbard, uh, uh, Robert Lefebvre and Erwin Filthy Pierre Strauss. Uh, New Libertarian Notes and Calendar and, uh, and a whole bunch of fanzines. So um, I'm very pleased to be addressing you on April 19th as we all know, April 19th is Patriots Day, uh, Lexington and Concord, yay! Uh, and uh, unfortunately, it was also the, uh, the first blood drawn in the Civil War. I had to look this up. Um, the, f the first Boston Marathon, the uh, Warsaw Uprising started today uh, in 1943, the Waco Massacre in 1993, 
and uh, and everybody's eligible to get the COVID vaccine this very year. Ooh, yay! <laughs> so uh, those are the notable events on on today. Aside from my speaking here, um, Sam died in 2004 at the age of 56 on the appropriately discordian day of February 23rd. Um, he. Uh, um, he was, he was a, a great thinker, even though he didn't have any pretension about him. He would just as soon hang out with science fiction fans at a dead dog party uh, drinking beer uh, than he would addressing the Eris Society or some other you know, collection of, of wealthy uh, entrepreneurs and uh, donors. Um, I always tried, you know, ever since I met Sam, I always tried to keep copies of everything that he did. Uh, so I have uh, multiple copies of his magazines and newsletters and, and so on. There are a few that when I was in uh, Paradise, California for a year in 1976 uh, that I may have gotten crossed in the mail. I don't have everything, but um, I tried to keep as much as I could. And the way I came into his papers was when he moved out of the Inarca village, uh, he had a garage and uh, I, had, I think I had taken over the payments on the garage and I uh, asked him if I could have any of his stuff that's in there and he said, sure, take it all, it doesn't matter. Uh, and then he moved into Culver City. I just drove by it today uh, on Overland, the Inarco Villa which was uh, a, a much nicer apartment uh, building than the Anarco Village, which was built in the 1920s. It survived the Long Beach earthquake, so we knew it was sturdy. Uh, but this one was much nicer. When he moved out of there, uh, I again asked him, well, you know, can I take some of your notes and papers and stuff, your letters? And he gave me more boxes of stuff. Uh, and a spindle of D uh, backup DVDs from his uh, computer. Uh, he gifted my daughter Vanessa with a couple of his Mac power books. Uh, Vanessa didn't have a, a use for them. She had her own laptop, so again, I, I acquired those. And uh, of course, like a, a box full of floppy disks, half of which are, are so old. They're uh, single-sided, single-density, uh, you know, uh, formatted for the Mac Plus. So some of them I can't even read, but I've, I've tried to recover everything that I could from the disks that were readable. Um, so that's been sitting around for 20 years in, in uh, what I call the great underground vault. 2019 was, was a, a bad year. Uh, I mean, for all of you who knew him, knew them, Brad Lineweaver, Neil Shulman both died within a month of each other in 2019. And that got me to thinking, uh, you know, <laughs> we're, we're no spring chickens. You know, the, the libertarian, the baby boomer libertarians are, uh, are vanishing. I, I had a list somewhere of, uh, you know, the the list of the dead, and it was, uh, it was not uh, a pleasant thought. Murray Rothbard, Carl Hess, Robert Shea, Robert Anton Wilson, Kerry Thornley, Chris Tame, Bill Patterson, and uh, just this Jan uh, uh, Butler Schaefer and just this January Jeff Riggenbach. So, uh, you know, that, that came as a shock to me. I didn't know until I sent out the uh, email to uh, inviting people to go to the GoFundMe page uh, that, uh, that his uh, wife, Susan Hoy, wrote back to me and informed me that, uh, you know, Jeff had passed away. So um, a, a lot of this is trying to make sure that moth and rust don't get to uh, Sam's legacy. I'm finding interesting stuff. I'm going to pass one thing around. I only had time to print out one thing because my, my printer crapped out. But here's a snarky letter from Roy Childs on uh, why he was uh, the real story as to how he quit the FLP. And, um, and his, his indignation at uh, the way Sam reported it in uh, New Libertarian. So uh, I figure they're both dead. <laughs> any, anyone, any correspondence of Sam's who's 
you know, just as dead or deader than Sam, uh, I, I figure we can make uh, public. I'm going to tread a little lightly with people who might still be alive or who are still alive, uh, who might be um, troubled by some of the exchanges, especially if they say, do not quote, do not print. But uh, I'm, I'm going to be f fairly loose because a lot of it is um, non-controversial. Uh, but there are some, some good things, some stuff from uh, Murray Rothbard, a lot from Diane Peterson, uh, and uh, who is also dead. Uh, and so what I'm doing, uh, I'm going to do the, the, uh, the archives in uh, four phases. The first phase is to scan everything. And uh, phase, and not you know, pay attention to what goes where. I'm just going to make notations as to where in the numerical uh, serial numbering of the scans these things go. Um, then will be categorization, which I scanned a box of Sam's letters in last year, last summer as a test, and I've while waiting for the disk drives to arrive for my uh, network accessible server, um, I've been categorizing those, and it's taken me about 70 hours to you know look at each page, to say okay who wrote that. In some time, in some cases, I have to do detective work uh, to figure out because they just sign it Nina, you know okay who's Nina, uh, you know <laughs> and stuff like that. So, uh, but I think I've got most of them figured out. And I think that over time, I will figure out, you know, everyone. Um, so categorization is phase two. Phase three will probably take the longest. That will be um, creating the text portion. Right now, everything is being scanned in as images. Um, then I'll, uh, I, I tried scanning it in where it creates the PDF with an image and the text. But someone pointed out to me that it's not just taking the image, it's uh, interpreting the image and creating a PDF based on that image. And in some cases, the, shall we say, um, quixotic, no, uh, mercurial, no, uh, strange layout of some of the issues uh, cause lines to be printed over other lines in the PDF. Not in the original, but in the PDF. So um, what I plan to do is preserve the image and uh, somehow put a, a text behind it or alongside it so that you can view the image and read along in a text uh, uh, field, uh, you know, what's, what's going on. Because the, the image is, is fine, but you really want to read and be able to search the text. Uh, because the whole point about this is to make it a searchable uh, uh, archive. Uh, so that's going to take a while, especially transcribing and uh, um, deciphering uh, Sam's nearly uh, impenetrable handwriting. He, he, I amazed him once by reading something that he had written because he didn't think anybody else could read his handwriting. Uh, so I, I'm singularly able to <laughs> uh, decode him, but it may take some time. And then phase four, when you can't scream anymore, old tagline from a movie, um, is where I will take the uh, videotapes and the audio tapes of his lectures. When he was doing the uh, Agorist Institute, he has a series of uh, classes and lectures in downtown Long Beach. And uh, I, I videotaped them on VHS and then VHSC, compact, and then uh, later for Carl Hess Club and other uh, events over there in, in Marina del Rey, uh, I, I had uh, digital um, D, DVR, D, <laughs> DAE, I forget, uh, some kind of digital format, little tiny uh, cassettes. And so, the goal will be to convert all those to high quality digital video and uh, you know clean it up because VHS from 1985 <laughs> uh, you know can't can't be all that great 
uh, and clean up the audio and, and make it available on probably on YouTube, but accessible through the archives. And uh, you know that, that'll be the four phases. I figure it'll take about a year. And because we're all Austrian economists here, or at least I hope all of us are, we understand the concept of opportunity cost. In order to do this, I have to forego the opportunity to finish my novels or get another IT job uh, now that I finally have my PhD. Um, or, or focus on this. So that's what I'm going to be doing uh, for, I hope, no more than a year. Uh, we'll see how it goes, but it may wind up being uh, a, a longer thing depending on you know, health and uh, other interruptions uh, along the way. But I will do my darndest. I've got the, uh, the Seagate Iron Wolf 8 terabyte drives for the NAS, and I'll be assembling that this week and uh, then, then I'll start scanning. The uh, archives.copubco.com will be the repository unless the people hosting the domain say I've overloaded it and I need to go somewhere else, in which case I'll either have to pay them more for more storage or uh, come up with a different uh, place, maybe with the same domain, but uh, just a different uh, place. So that's all in the future. Right now there's some stuff on archives.copubco.com that you can look at. Uh, I scanned in all of the um, New Libertarian weeklies, so that's about 570 pages of good stuff. And, um, and there are other things, pamphlets and so on, some really early pamphlets that Sam did in 1972. The one thing I don't have, the, the, the jewel of the Nile, is uh, a four-page zine that he did before New Libertarian. When he was at the University of Wisconsin, he did something called laissez-faire. I only have one very bad, crooked Xerox of the first issue, there were five, uh, that Don Meinshausen sent uh, to Sam with a note like, hey Sam, you know, you interested? And, uh, you know, before I could uh, get back to him, you know, some years had passed, and he had donated everything to the Hoover Institute at Stanford, so I have no idea if, if Stanford still has them. They asked me for contact information for him so that they could send back some stuff that they didn't want anymore. They, they, they no longer wanted publications. So for all I know, they may have either sent it back to him or thrown it out. I, but that, that would be, uh, if I could find copies of that, that would round out the entire Konkin collection. Anyone know where I can find those? So uh, with that, um, I guess I will open it up to questions. And uh, if you want anecdotes about Sam, I've got a buttload of those too. Yes, uh, on your, um, you're, you're changing the, uh, are you able yourself to, uh, to change them, or are you equipped to change them from OVHS to uh, newer medium? Yeah, I've, I've got a, I've got a uh, machine that uh, a Sony, uh, VHS player and DVD recorder that I can uh, transfer them to DVDs and I've done that to most of them but I don't know if that's the highest quality uh, transfer that I can do maybe I can maybe there are places that do you know higher quality transfers where even though it, it looks just as crappy as VHS there's a lot more information there that can be played with you know to adjust uh, the the video and color balance and and uh, sharpen and uh, you know get rid of the muffled sound of of not having a lavalier mic for Sam just using the mic on the uh, video camera. Okay. Uh, how 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 on the ones you have put on the DVDs uh, are they uh, good enough and completely understandable? Yes, they are, but because it's show them as a class sort of thing. Uh, yeah, again, because it's I, again, I'd have to clean up the sound because it is kind of muffled, but that's doable I, as I understand it. Um, and another thing is, he did a lot of drawing on a green board with the yellow chalk, right? And the camera didn't pick that up well. So uh, as a test, I've been taking one, and I've been just doing PowerPoint 
uh, versions, you know, a green PowerPoint with yellow, you know, comic lettering, so that I can uh, insert those uh, as he's talking, uh, so people can actually see what he's uh, what he's writing there. And of course, the handwriting will be much better <laughs> than than his handwriting. So uh, yeah, that's all I've got. Uh, when I bought my latest yeah. Mac, I, I made sure that I bought um, uh, Logic uh, Logic Pro uh, Plus, Logic Pro X, which is uh, sound editing, uh, and um, uh, Final Final Cut, Final Cut, uh, yeah, which is the video editing. And it's a lot like iMovie, so it's very, I, I know what to do uh, with it. So that, that was how I did the GoFundMe fundraiser video was on Final Cut Pro, so. Okay, I think the Hoover Institute uh, finding aids, I think, are online. Mm -hmm. um, you may be able to find those on, it seems to me like, uh, it used to be they had them published a whole bunch of big books, you had to, but I think, I think some, at least some of the stuff is online. I'll check it out because uh, the last time I talked to them was two years ago, uh, and uh, you know they were right in the midst of moving everything out of their old uh, library into the new fancy schmancy, much larger uh, Hoover Institute uh, environment. So I, I presume they're done with that now, and they're a little more relaxed. They seemed a little frazzled when I <laughs> when I wrote to them last time. There's a company called the Vinegar Syndrome, mm -hmm. which does some amazing work with, uh, you know, ripping something from a VHS and putting it on Blu-ray. Mm -hmm. uh, you wouldn't think that it actually came from a VHS. But, uh -huh. uh, you could you could ask ask them for advice. Uh, Vinegar Syndrome. Vinegar Syndrome. Hey, what? Well, hey, I've got it recorded here. Vinegar <laughs> yeah, Syndrome. Vinegar yeah. Syndrome, right? Sounds like a song from the 50s. Vin, vin, vinegar syndrome. Vin, vin, no, never mind. You had one, Mike. Uh, yeah. Presumably a lot of this material you want to be, you want to be searchable. Do you have a time yes. going on? Well, that's, that's the phase, uh, phase three. three. And I would hope that, see, I could do it piecemeal, but that doesn't make sense to me. I'm, I'm much more uh, OCD yeah, when it comes. Started yeah. At some point and once I start something, I've got to finish it, <laughs> and so when, once I start scanning, you know that's that's all I'm going to focus on. It's on phases one and two. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So once it's uh, scanned and categorized, then I can go through and say, all right, now let's let's make some sense of this. So Is there any way that um, ordinary mortals can assist you in this. No, I'm, as I said, too OCD to uh, let it, uh, let anyone else help me. But there are ways that we can participate. Yes, there is one way you can yes. participate. And in the flyer, you'll have the uh, URL and the QR code for the GoFundMe campaign. Actually, the QR code is for if you wanted to pay by PayPal. And the uh, URL on the front page is for the, uh, is the GoFundMe presentation. I started it, I, I just, I picked a, a, what I figured would be a wild amount just, you know, to compensate for a full year and allow me to get all the equipment that I needed to do this, like the NAS server and the, uh, the drives. I already have scanner, I already have the computer, I have the Logic Pro, I have the, you know, I have, I, there's, there's a list in one of the updates of everything that I have already. Uh, that uh, nobody needs to fund me for. Um, I picked 230204, I think, because Sam died on February 23rd, 2004. So I figured that would that would be a amusing amount. And son of a gun, people have been donating. Uh, we're two thirds of the way there. It's like seventeen thousand seven hundred twenty dollars or something. At the last time I looked. Uh, I, I'm, I'm amazed. People that I know have, have com contributed. People I've never heard of that said, "Yeah, you know, I, I mean, uh, Sam Konkin is uh, or Sec Three is all over the uh, internet. You know, Agoras everywhere. Uh, you know, the the founder of Silk Road, the the convict, the convicted founder of Silk Road, credited New Libertarian Manifesto and Alongside Night." with uh, inspiring him to create the, the uh, you know, encrypted Silk Road uh, buy anything 
uh, secretly. Obviously not so secretly because he got caught, uh, but uh, yeah. So the ideas are out there. I want to make the ideas more available. Um, and if anybody has, I finally did this, you know, this, this is the PhD in information uh, security. I had no Bitcoin wallet for the last 10 years. Uh, and I finally got one because people were saying, you know, do you want to pay, uh, can, do you accept Bitcoin? I'll donate to you if you accept in Bitcoin. So here's a Bitcoin address for anyone who's interested. No, just, just aim your cameras right here. There's a, there's a QR code. Just Anyway, um, so that's, uh, that's, that's what I, I've, I've been, the, and the, the comments that people make when they, they donate, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, they're, re they're really grateful that Sam's stuff is going to be made available. Uh, you know, they're, they're saying things like, you know, we've got to take care of the future. And uh, the best way to take care of the future would be to get these online. So that's what I'm going to do. Any other questions? The whole thing will ultimately, you want to have the whole thing, all the digitized stuff, will be online. Yes, at no cost. Okay. So, uh, you know, I, years ago, you know, I had these tapes of Sam, and I thought, well, okay, maybe I'll, I'll you know, convert them all onto DVD, and then, you know, just, just burn a bunch of DVDs myself and make a little box set and sell them. And, they, you know, I, I'm two-thirds of a century old. Exactly. You know, last week I turned 66.666 years old. You know, bar over the last six, infinite repeating. So uh, I'm not as interested in, you know, selling stuff and making a profit. I think, you know, with Sam dead, with Neil dead, you know, with Brad dead, with, you know, everybody's dying. And uh, so we've got to think about the next generation. So, you know, make it available. By the way, that brings up a point. Mm -hmm. On the collection, uh, the rights and all that thing, have you decided who's going to go, where all this is going to go on your demise? Ha! Oh, well, you see, like, like Stephen Wright, I'm working on immortality. <laughs> so far, so good. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I haven't, um, but neither did Sam. But he left it uh, with me, and if I can get it digitized, it uh, would just be a matter of, uh, you know, funding some sort of perpetual uh, uh, payment, one, payment for the... one possibility on this, stuff. Well, there's a number of possibilities, I guess, but one possibility might be the Libertarian Party itself. Oh, no, no, no. No, no, no. They would burn every. No, Sam was a founding member. He thought it was. No, no. So there wasn't. There wasn't. Yeah. Because, there was a little bad blood. Okay. I'm just. <laughs> I'm just mentioning. It, is there doing a big thing on archiving their stuff? Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Maybe. This. This is what's amazing. I. I because I, I did this, I've actually uh, corresponded now with someone who is archiving. You know, scanning, doing the same thing, scanning in and converting. Uh, all the papers of the late Dave Nolan. Now, some of you may know that Dave Nolan and Sam Conkin exchanged letters uh, in the uh, mid 70s, early 70s, about the Libertarian Party. They insult and each other? Hmm? did they insult each other? Uh, there, there was the one. No, that was with Robert Poole. Uh, Sam, there's a video on on uh, YouTube of, of uh, Sam and Robert Poole. Uh, debating uh, what is a libertarian. Uh, but Dave Nolan and uh, he ex exchanged some letters. I haven't found them yet, but I've got six more boxes of, of letters to scan. Um, I'm sure I'll find something. Uh, so, so he's doing David Nolan stuff. Somebody else wrote me because he had seen uh, the Robert Anton Wilson list of uh, articles on CoPubCo and said, uh, hey, I'm uh, archiving Robert Anton Wilson's stuff, and, but I'm missing these articles. Could you send them to me? So I sent him a bunch of New Libertarians. 
And uh, so, uh, so all of a sudden, I'm, I've entered into the archivist world. <laughs> uh, so uh, I, I think it's great, you know. I, I, if I find anything of Dave Nolan's, I'll probably send it uh, to him. If I find anything of Robert Anton Wilson, uh, I'll send it to that guy. So uh, together, we're building this uh, digital universe of uh, great libertarian thinkers. And Dave Nolan. Okay, and the amount you said that you uh, mm -hmm. hope to get, get from this? Huh? Get to, to compensate for your not doing your novels and stuff when you're I, I figure, you know, uh, when I was working at uh, Boeing, I was getting $50 an hour. <laughs> but scanning, uh, I've, I've priced myself at $10 an hour. <laughs> so I think I can, I can live on that. I've got a, I've got a pension. I've got <laughs> Social Security. And crap like that, uh, all that, all that unlibertarian stuff that we're supposed to reject, but we're not as rich as Robert Lefebvre, so we just can't send the check back with a nasty note attached to it. So, um, anyway, I, I I I think I can get by on that. And Total amount oh uh, well, for for a year, I, I, I estimated twenty three thousand something, and we've got seventeen thousand, so I'm off to a good start. If I uh, you know if I run out, uh, you know, I'll just I'll beg more. <laughs> okay. Yes. A question. Okay, where do you see Horizon right now? Is there some kind of movement? I I was amazed. I was amazed. You know, m most. Most people, you know, pass away and, and they're forgotten even by their, their descendants in two generations. Uh, so I was amazed, you know, you just search on the word agorism or agorist and you'll find all kinds of stuff. You know, hashtag agorist, hashtag agorism. Uh, some people call themselves uh, anarcho-capitalists, ANCAP. Uh, and a lot of them seem very true to uh, what Sam was was trying to do, what he was professing. Uh, and the other reason for me to do this is to prevent deviationism. You don't want people to say, "Well, you know, I'm I'm an, an agora socialist. I'm an agora, you know, a, <laughs> agorist uh, democrat." Uh, you know. You, you, uh, he would be, that would be what would offend him. You know, not people taking his ideas and expanding upon them, taking his ideas and creating new works from them. What he would hate would be taking his ideas and twisting them once again to the state. So uh, I'm sure I can find a lot of emails from him. Yes, Mike. No, I finished your sentence. Oh, I'm, I'm sure I can find a lot of emails from him in his backup drives where he is chiding people for uh, deviationism or he's uh, encouraging people to, you know, follow their entrepreneurial dreams and just ignore the state. Well, you know, I just heard you about 20 minutes ago, 30 minutes ago, you used the term libertarian left. What does that mean? It sounds like an oxymoron. No, it's, well, it, with what is called the left now, it does seem oxymoronic. But on archives.copupco.com, uh, at the very bottom there, there's the uh, MLL political spectrum. <laughs> MLL political spectrum. Um, in the early 80s, Sam felt that there were a lot more um, people on the left, the so-called traditional left, the hippies, the, uh, the, the anti-war types, uh, that he could convinced to be libertarians. And so he started the movement of the libertarian left. Uh, and then he encountered uh, confusion <laughs> from people. And he tried to, he created the MLL political spectrum where he explains that in the original French Assemblée, where uh, the party in power sat on the right of the Assemblée and the party out of power sat on the left, much as Congress does today, 
You know, the right now the uh, you know the Democrats are on the right, liber uh, the, the the Republicans are on the left because they're out of power. Uh, and then when they change things, they switch seats. So that was the original concept. However, the left has decided that it's the perpetual left, the perpetually, they want to identify with being out of power and uh, you know, being the ones that are constantly against uh, the government. But now they're, they're, they possess every lever of power now. They've, they have the left, has the media, it has the academia, it has uh, social media, it has the, the government at multiple levels. Uh, so they are actually now the right. And the MLL political spectrum put all the statists and politicians at the right. And of course, uh, the New Libertarian Alliance and the MLL at the farthest left. And between that spectrum, he had uh, you know, old, he had leftist uh, libertarians, uh, he had centrist libertarians, he had uh, centrist uh, statists, you know, uh, ultra statists, and, and then, you know. I want my lawyer. <laughs> yeah. So he's trying to reclaim the uh, language that the left has successfully uh, usurped and, and, uh, used to undercut all arguments. Now, uh, I, I don't, I, I think that his plan to draw people away from the left into libertarianism uh, didn't work. <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, God bless him for trying. Uh, I, I just think that people on the, what we call the left, uh, are, are just, for the most part, more wedded to statism uh, than they are to any notion of liberty. And it's only polarized completely now where uh, you know, the people on the right are uh, much more libertarian than people on the left. So uh, I don't think that the terminology is recoverable at this point, so uh, you know, I, I've put the, uh, the spectrum out there. You'll, you'll notice that half of the organizations that he lists on the spectrum are gone, and, uh, and, and two-thirds of the people on it are dead. So, but it still, it still gives you the, the big picture. Yeah. Yes? My son is on a Discord chat room, or I guess a Discord something. Whatever they call it. Yeah. Chat room or something like that. I haven't used it myself. It was in one where I think it was simply divided into four quadrants. Yeah. And you know, half of it was authoritarian, the other half was libertarian, and then it was right and left. I didn't think quite covered it. Yeah. Um, and I sometimes we sometimes when we go on our walks we do something called sometimes we do twenty questions, sometimes we do categories. Mm -hmm. And uh, one time we were listing isms, mm -hmm. and I threw out anarcho romanticism. <laughs> Can you explain what that is? Why that's everything that I write. <laughs> uh, I, I'm a, uh, I consider myself a romantic uh, in that I have a positive uh, view of life and an optimistic outlook for the future. And uh, in my, I, I would say that my novel *Kings of the High Frontier* is probably the most anarcho-romantic of them all, where you have all these conspiracies of disappointed NASA uh, uh, engineers. Can I quickly talk about this for a second? Mm -hmm. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming back. I really do appreciate it. But please, for everybody's safety, you need to have a mask to leave the table. Yes. Something I forgot to do when I went to the bathroom. <laughs> so I came out with a paper towel on my face. Um, so in Kings of the High Frontier, a bunch of uh, engineers, just like Atlas Shrugged, they start vanishing. Uh, they, so, some of the efforts to get into space are, are above ground, like uh, the billionaire Larry Pubel, who's trying to build an upgraded X-15 to go orbital finds that he can't in the 
EPUB version of the novel, I realized that he really couldn't get into orbit, uh, even on an upsized uh, X-15, so he does a sort of a Sanger uh, skip around the world. Uh, and then you've got uh, somebody else who's building a single stage to orbit space station fully assembled, which it was an actual design by Bruce Neufer uh, for um, uh, one of the rocket companies back in uh, the 60s there. Beautiful thing, it's on the cover and it looks like a, a bracelet or a crown. It's just uh, 16 uh, um, spherical, conical uh, rockets, you know, mostly tank and uh, aerospike engine. And once it gets into space, the tanks are empty, you use the leftover oxygen, uh, you know, you use the leftover hydrogen, you make water, you make air, and you, you know, the next flight you start bringing up stuff to populate it. So, um, the lead character is a uh, astronaut who gets drummed out of the uh, of NASA Corps. And uh, no, uh, it's not here. It's, it's available online at uh, Smashwords. It's called Kings of the High Frontier. That's one of my first novels, and it's, uh, it's a little less romantic and more psychotic. <laughs> I more romantic, less psychotic. Yeah. How do I get it? Uh, you can go to Smashwords.com. Smash. It's available there. Uh, hmm? What did you say? Smash words. Yeah, smash, smash words. Or or state, yeah. Smash or Amazon. Just search on Komen, K O M A N at Amazon and you'll find it there too. But I prefer Smash Words because it's not Amazon. <laughs> uh, sorry Amazon. Don't hate me. Just kidding. <laughs> yes. Suddenly the lights go out and a shot rings out. Um, so the upshot is the government's trying to stop people from getting into space. Uh, they enlist the UN in creating a worldwide uh, treaty that basically turns everything over to the government. Uh, but if they can get into orbit before that law takes effect, they're grand. Well, they're not grandfathered in. The government will still want to take them over, but they'll be in space and there's no way the government can enforce it. So. That's, that's the race. And uh, I wrote it and started it in 1976. I, I really started working on it on in, ni in the mid 80s. Finished it in 92. Finally came out in hardback in 96. Uh, it anticipated the X Prize because one of the characters has a, uh, uh, offers a billion dollars to anyone who can get into orbit uh, before the treaty goes into effect. So the race is on. And uh, the book was published online by Janiel Shulman's, uh, um, not, not even uh, pulpless.com, but SoftServe. Uh, <laughs> back, yeah, back in, uh, uh, back in 92, 94, something. Uh, when it, whenever the uh, X Prize was announced, my book came out within the same week. So, uh, it's it. I consider it my, my most romantic novel, my my Victor Hugo novel, my Atlas Shrugged for the Space Age. So, even if I do, even if I did write the blurb myself. <laughs> so, uh, do you have anything uh, in progress or in mind right now? Yeah, I've got a first novel in a series that I'm working on, but I don't want to talk about it. It's about two thirds done, uh, but I've sort of stalled out on it while I'm doing this, so. Uh, you will get back. Yes, yes I will. Once, once, uh, Sam is, once I know Sam's legacy is safe, I will get back to it. Who knows, I might even do it evenings and weekends. But for now, it's the Agoras Archives of Samuel Edward Conkin III. Thank you for your service. <laughs> Thank you for letting me be serviced. Does anybody else have any last questions? Or Are we going to remember this now? Uh, well, sure. We've all got Sam's stories. Some yeah. Maybe don't want to.
I'd like to start with the short one. Okay. okay. When he was on the Overland, and I think he was on Neil Schumann did the post of all the movies. And uh, he, he'd have a party, and he'd have a little sign outside. Uh -huh. Non-smokers will be tolerated. Yes, yes. Non-smokers will be tolerated. Yes, I, I remember the parties there, and of course he, every year, because he was born the day after, uh, not the day after Heinlein was born, but the, his birth date is the day after Heinlein was born. Uh, Heinlein was born 7707, Sam was born 7847. So he would always hold an annual Heinlein Konkin birthday party. And usually that would be at a, uh, a Westercon or a Worldcon, 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 I don't remember. Uh, whatever con was over the July 4th weekend, uh, he would hold a Heinlein Konkin birthday party, and if there wasn't a convention, it would be held at his apartment. And uh, you know, he would he would be there smoking his pipe, and uh, you know, people would be imbibing, and uh, and so on. Uh, did I ever tell you about the time that uh, that he got stabbed in a holdup? No. What? No. Okay. Um, one time I. I walked into his apartment to see Chris Schaefer, the manager, um, with Sam on, sitting down with his uh, shirt up and he was uh, treating a, a hole in Sam's back. And uh, I said, uh, what happened? And Sam explained that he was walking home uh, late in the evening on 7th Street and these two young punks not punks, he liked punk, uh, thugs, uh, you know, tried to hold him up. And Sam, you know, being Sam, said, nah, I don't have any money, you know. You try, try someone else that actually has some money. And, you know, he, he, I think he used some profanity and kept walking. And one of the kids came up to him and stuck a knife in his back, probably maybe inch and a half, two inches, I don't know. Uh, but it, uh, you know, Sam was was well armored, shall we say, uh, physically, and uh, it didn't hit any vital organs or muscles or much of anything. Uh, so uh, Chris was able to stitch him up, but he was wearing a white jacket, you know, white linen jacket. Why do I keep doing that? I need wireless microphones. Um, and so he was going to throw it out, and I said, can I keep it? <laughs> and he said, why do you want it? I said, holy blood, <laughs> you know, holy, <laughs> and we can, we can worship it when you're gone. So I still have it. We can either worship it or we can clone him from it, from it. so one or the other. Uh, but he didn't want to go to a hospital, didn't want to go to a government-run hospital institution. Uh, so he was perfectly content with having a fellow uh, agorist do an agorist uh, patch job on him. And uh, the scar was visible after it healed, uh, but uh, he, that's the kind of guy he was, you know. I, I have a feeling, uh, he always said that, uh, you know, if somebody burst into his apartment, you know, with a gun saying, the cops are on my tail. I, I, I need you to get me out of here. He said, well, here are the keys. You know, good luck. <laughs> Go with the Agora. So, uh, anybody else have any stories about him? Any quirks? We know he had a lot of quirks. He made this uh, breakfast uh, omelet that he called the heart stopper omelet, right? Or a heart attack omelet with lots of butter and, you know, several eggs and bacon and stuff. and. Uh, uh, I guess it worked. <laughs> <laughs> what about serrated knives? What about them? Oh, did he have a thing about serrated knives? Well, yes, he did. Oh, wrote a oh, the milk is milk is a sauce. And yes. Serrated knives. Yeah. No, he never used a serrated knife to slice uh, vegetables or fruit. That's yeah, that that makes sense. She always use a sharp, straight knife. Uh, so yeah, Sam was very generous in his own way. Absolutely. He was very kind to me. He, he tolerated me because 
I was a fellow pipe smoker and I enjoyed dark beer, so we thought, well, it can't be all bad. <laughs> I knew he's a hated party art, but, you know, I'll give him, I'll give him a pass this time. And he, he would be friends with anyone who, you know, was, was decent and, uh, you know, open with him. And uh, so he had the, the, the only, you know, thing that he would feud with people uh, in a non-romantic uh, uh, way uh, would be, uh, you know, if they sort of rejected uh, libertarianism to whatever degree. I mean, he... He was disappointed when Dana Rohrabacher ran for Congress, but he didn't abandon Dana as a friend, you know. Uh, so that's why Dana showed up at his memorial. So... Yeah, I want to say another thing. Uh, actually, um, you know this, Mike, the same work for me back in New York as a type center. Yeah, on the, Mergen on the mighty Mergenthaler, right? So that's right. Yeah. That's right. And, and any other equipment that I had, you know, uh -huh. the, the IBM, the IBM machine was like a type of Yeah, a computer graphic. Here's what I remember about it. I had a friend, Howie Katz, mm -hmm. a very smart man. He was a, he was a teacher in New Hampshire. He got me into Liberty and Ayn Rand. Uh -huh. And I still remember how he said, he said, Michael, if you drop your watch from the second story, it's not running. It hits the ground and starts running. That doesn't mean that that's the right way to fix it. <laughs> so, so Howie Katz and Sam had something in common. They both were quite aware that their intelligence was two or three cuts higher than most other people. But they were never patronizing or dismissive of others. So I remember that fondly about Sam. He was, he was patient. You know, unkind, like like my son, kind. And it, if you didn't understand the concept, there was some confusion, he would just call me, tell you, like, listen, one and one is two. You're not a jerk. You just got to understand that one and one is not two point five. One and one is two. That's all. And so I remember him telling me for that. Yeah, I, I once asked Sam, you know, how how he dealt with what I considered stupid questions, and he said. Well, I, I just assume everyone's ignorant, but I, I don't think anyone's willfully stupid. And uh, so he was more than willing to, uh, you know, expound upon anything, uh, to explain it to people with no malice, with no, uh, you know, uh, haughtiness. Uh, he, he just, uh, you know, he, he figured people were eager to learn, and he was eager to teach. So... Well, I met Sam with occasions, you know, for less time. Uh -huh. But what impressed me is that he's always a very cheerful guy. So I asked him one day, well, how do you stay so cheerful when you don't want the forces to bring you against you? He said, beer. <laughs> and he said, every day I get up, I think to myself, what can I do today to smash the state? Mm -hmm. And to me, that's always been my philosophy since then, that mm -hmm. I mean, you get to what can I do today? Remember, this is the day the Lord has given us to smash the state. <laughs> This is the day the Lord has given us to smash the state. <laughs> Just there, there's some guy on, you know, the Rush Limbaugh. You know, Rush Limbaugh, he's dead, but they're keeping his radio show going because he had so much that he had to say over the 30 years that he was broadcasting that they can keep digging up something that is relevant for today. And I feel the same way about Sam, that, you know, through his uh, 30 years of, of uh, activity and writing, prodigious writer, prodigious publisher, that he, that the things he wrote about and, and spoke about over the last 30 years are still relevant today and can be drawn from. And the, the line that I just made up was uh, half of Sam, half of a guy named Todd Herman, who starts out every broadcast on when he's on the show with today is the day God has given us you know this, this is the time God has chosen us so don't, don't forget to smash the state was the last thing that Sam uh, said to me and I was I'm, I'm probably the last person actually to see him a lot yeah um, uh, 
the last time I saw him, it was uh, Friday night uh, at, at our pub club. I drove him home, and he was telling me all about his ambitions. Uh, uh, he w wanted to uh, bring out, uh, uh, bring back a new isolationist. I, mm -hmm. I dropped him off outside his apartment, and of course he said, "So long, and don't don't forget to uh, uh, smash the state." And then Monday, I I. I'm on the internet and it says Sam Conkin did it at 56. I said, no, that can't, that can't be right. I saw him Friday, Friday night. Oh, well, there you are. Yeah. Uh, as I recall, uh, the, the, the uh, manager of the apartment heard water running. Heard water running. And uh, for the longest time, I guess somebody complained about it or maybe it started overflowing and dripping. I, I don't remember really. Uh, and so he called... Sam's employer, or did he call Neil? I, I, I don't know. I don't remember, and, and Neil didn't talk about it much, or at least I didn't you know, query him much about it. But he was called down uh, to go in there, and they, they found him uh, in the bathroom dead. And, uh, you know, just, just like Elvis. And so, uh, you know, that, that was it. Uh, so, uh, according to Neil, uh, the coroner didn't do an autopsy, just looked at him and said, yeah, heart attack. Uh, and uh, so, we assume it was natural causes. Yeah, they, uh, they, they, they don't do um, autopsies unless they suspect foul play. Yes, but, but Sam was the premier uh, anarchist well, theorist of, never, of his he, time. He, yeah. he, he, <laughs> Many people wanted him silenced, I'm sure. This year it would have been COVID, no question. Yeah, yeah, exactly. When you said he died like Elvis, and he was on the throne at the time? Well, no. He, I think he was getting ready to take a bath, and he, uh, they, they said he walked from the sink to the trying to get to the door and, and collapsed. Okay, so the water was still running. Yeah, yeah. No, in the tub. He was preparing his tub. He always liked to, here's a quirk, uh, he would uh, fill up the tub with hot water and then drain it because the hot water, uh, the heat from the water had been transferred to the, to the tub. And then he would refill it with hot water so that the tub and the uh, water would be maximum temperature. Was there any damage to the apartment on, like, overflow or anything? I, I don't know. I, you know, I, I was in Huntington Beach, but I, I wasn't, you know, nobody called me and told me about it until Neil let me know. Uh, I was probably the first person he called, uh, but who knows. Uh, we can't ask him now either. So, there you go. Anyway, thank you very much for inviting me here and for you know letting me ramble on for as long as I did. Uh, I, I hope you're as enthused as I am about this uh, idea of the archives. And uh, you know, if any of you have uh, anything going back to uh, when Sam was in New York, like uh, you know, old issues of uh, laissez-faire. Uh, <laughs> I, I would, uh, you know, you don't have to mail me the originals, uh, just, uh, you know, my contact information is in the copebco.com contacts page, and uh, Mike knows how to get to me. So, uh, you know, we, I shall, I shall see you in a year with uh, more to report on. Uh, Please come back. Yes. Yes, and, and thank you for the dinner. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thank you. Ha <laughs> ha.